با سلام به بینندگان عزیز برنامه اینان گال سرخ رو نگاه میکنید یک مجله سیاسی اجتماعی که روی کانال جدید پخش میشه من مریم نمازی هم و برنامه امروز رو با همکاران بسیار عزیزم هم بهرام سروش سلام. و فریبرز پویا سلام. بهتون تقدیم میکنم برنامه این هفته در رابطه با قدقن کردن برغا از سوی دولت فرانسه است و خب بالاخره خیلی طرفدار و مخالف این تصمیم هستن و بودن از نظر من یه کار خیلی خوبیه اتفاقا همه جا باید برغ قدقن بشه یعنی کاملا محف کردن زن خواست محف کردن زن و باید به زنایی که زیر برغا هستن به عنوان زنایی که مثل, مثل کسایی که ناپدید شدن توی آرژانتین بعد اونجوری بهشون نگاه کرد زنان محف شده ناپدید شده مصاحبه ای داریم در این رابطه با گیتای سحگال که رئیس مرکز سنتر فر سیکلر سپید مرکز مکان های سکولاره و جالب اینجاست که گیتا یه موقعی برای سازمان عفو بین الملل کار میکرد مسئول بخش زنانشون بود و اخراجش کردن به خاطر اینکه مخالفت کرد با رابطه عفو بین الملل با یه سازمان اسلامی به اسم کیج پریزنرز مصابه خیلی جالبه حتما به این مصابه هم گوش بدین امیدوارم خوشتون بیاد ازش و در زم خب مثل هر هفته یک فتوای احمقانم خواهیم داشت ولی قبل از اینکه بریم بحث کنیم روی موضوع یه کلیپ کوتاهی در رابطه با این را با هم گوش بدیم با ما باشید دادگاه حقوق بشر اروپا قانون فرانسه را جهت قدقن کردن پوشیدن برق مورد تایید قرار داده است و این بحث را که این قانون آزادی مذهب و بیان را نفع می کند را رد کرد دولت فرانسه گفته است که این قانون امنیت اجتماعی را تأمین می کند و زنانی را که مجبور شدند صورت خود را بپوشانند را حمایت می کند البته انتقاد مخالفان این قانون این است که این قانون ضد مسلمانان و تبعیض علیه اقلیت های مذهبی می باشد میدونین برای من چیزی که خیلی جالب اینه که میای یه کاری در دفاع از حق زن انجام میده مثلا یه دولتی بعد آدما میگن تبعیض آمیزه آخه داری جلوی تبعیض علیه زن رو میگیری چجوری یک عملی که طرفدار زن تبعیض آمیزه واقعا بعضی اوقات میکنم دنیا وارونه شده وقتی این چیزا رو آدم میشنوه همیشه در دنیای وارونه وقتی میخوای یه کاری رو توی جامعه انجام بدی باید جلوی یه سری کارا رو گرفت جلو گرفتن قدقن کردن چیز ضرورتا بدی نیست بردهداری رو اگه بخوای برداری باید جلوی یه سری آدم ها بردار رو بگیری اگه بخوای جلوی تنبیه کودکان رو بگیری باید جلوی یه سری پدر مادر رو و مراکز مذهبی رو باید بگیری اگه بخوای چه میدونم یه کسی میاد توی محیط در بسته سیگار میکشه میخواد زمانی که بچه هستن بخوا بعد جلوی سیگار کشیدن بگیره خب حتما محدود میکنی محدودیت ذرا چیزی بدی نیست و جامعه به یه سطحی میرسه بعضی وقتا که لازمی محدودیت ها رو به وجود بیاره به خصوص در این مورد که نصف زنا تو جامعه رو همونطوری که شما خودتون گفتید دارن محو میکنن از جامعه میخوان زیر یه پرده نگه دارن این به نظر من یکی از بهترین کارهایی که دولت فرانسه کرده و هر دلیل دلایلی هم که اوبرده به نظر من مهم نیست یکی از شاهکارهای جامعه و بشریت مدرن و این باید به تمام کشورها سرعت بکنه یعنی واقعیتش اینه که خب خیلی از جنبش های اجتماعی وقتی نگاه میکنین یه بخشی از مبارزه اینه که خب یه چیزایی رو یه تغییراتی تو قانون میخوان بالاخره اینجاست دیگه قانونه که کمک میکنه از بعضیا دفاع کرد و کمک میکنه که جلوی یه سری آدما رو گرفت یعنی دقیقا این تغییر توی قانون قدقن کردن چیزی که ضد زنه چیز خیلی مثبتیه هر تغییری تو قانون و هر قدقن کردن هم تو که گفتین یه چیز منفی لزوما نیست ببین الان تو فرانسه همون جایی که این قانون رو وضع کردن تو زنای خیلی زیادی وجود دارن دخترای خیلی زیادی وجود دارن که ظاهر قضیه است که اینا خودشون حجاب سرشون کردن یا چادر سرشون کردن یا برخ نقاب زدن ولی واقعیتش اینطوری نیست اگه بری توی اون جوامع اون اون کامیونیتی ها رو نگاه بکنی ببینی که چه فشارهایی باعث میشه که اینا از ترس و وحشت مجبور بشن به اون تن بدن و این کاری که اولین کاری که این قانون میکنه به اینا قدرت میده که میگه که من که بخوام برم بیرون خانوادهش نمیتونه بگه که چرا برغتو نزدی چرا میخوای بری بیرون میگه که اگه برم بیرون منو دستگیر میکنم غیر قانونیه الان قانون هست که من نمیتونم دیگه برغ داشته باشم و این اولین منفعت این قانون یعنی قدرت میده به اون زن و دختری که سالها زیر اون ستم بوده اولین بار میتونه بگه که آها 
پس یه چیزی هست داره از من دفاع میکنه بهش اعتماد به نفس میتونه میتونه گام اولیه که برای این که بتونه یه آدم مستقل بر خودش باشه و از این فشار را کم بکنه به خصوص وقتی به مسئله برقه خود برقه و نقاب نگاه میکنه این دقیقا واقعا پرچم اسلام سیاسیه خب کلا هجاب هم هست ولی بیشت این مثلا نک تیز نشونه نک تیز حمله جنبش اسلام سیاسی به زنه و هر جمع که اسلامی قدرت میگیره مثلا الان داعش رفته تو عراق برقه رو کرده لباسی که زنا بعد بپوشن آره هر جا که تو حکومت هستن با زور و فشار و کتک و تنبیه اجرا میکنن این حرفا موقعی هم که تو قدرت نیستن توی یه جوامعی هستن که دستشون به قدرت نمیرسه با فشار از تصعی میکنن طریق بحثای انتخاب و در واقع بحث وارانه حق آدم و حق انسان وارد بشن که ولی باید باشه مخالفت بشون بزن. بریم الان یک مصاحبه با گیتا ساحگل نگاه کنیم مصاحبه طولانی 20 دقیقه سالی واقعا به نظرم مفیده به خصوص چون یه سری اطلاعاتی میده در رابطه با دیدگاه این سازمان های حقوق بشر مثل عفه بنومن روی مسئله هجاب و, و رابطه شون با جریانات اسلامی و یه سری چیزا میگه که قبلا هیچ جا نگفته برای همین از این نظرم خیلی جالبه حتما اینو نگاه کنید بعد برمیگردیم باز با هم صحبت میکنیم با ما باشید Gita Sakhal, welcome to our program. I wanted to ask you about the recent European Human Rights Court upholding of France's banning of the face veil. Do you think it was a good move? I think it was an excellent decision. Um, I, I'm not sure if I agree with every detail of how it was argued, but overall, I think it was a good decision. And the reason I think it's a good decision and a good a decision, in fact, in defense of human rights as opposed to all the major human rights organizations who've condemned it, is that there is no appetite at all anywhere that I can see among the major Western human rights organizations to examine violence, murder, coercion in the name of the veil. They have Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International have not produced reports on that issue. We just hear about how it's a choice and a right, basically. Exactly. We hear about the other side a lot. And we have a succession of women who are probably political Islamists going to court to defend their right to wear the veil. The only cases I know that have been taken against forced veiling, um, there was a case in Bangladesh that Sarah Hussain took, uh, I think, to the Supreme Court in Bangladesh and got a judgment against forced veiling. Uh, but it's human rights activists in parts of the world that are most affected by veiling who see that. So again, you see in Iran, we have a report recently come out on sexuality and human, right, and human rights issues, which looks at mandatory gender reassignment and mandatory veiling as a problem. And I know that the Iranian feminists who've done that work are very concerned that the human rights organizations actually tried to silence them on this. I mean, I don't think you're surprised, obviously, with the response of the human rights groups. You yourself was head of the gender unit at Amnesty International, and you were suspended and forced to leave because of your, um, you know, your opposition to Amnesty's relationship with cage prisoners, which is an Islamist organization. And I know you've had debates with them on the veil. What, what was that like? Well, when I was head of the gender unit, we were running a major campaign on stop violence against women all around the world. And the issue of veiling kept coming up. Now, where did it keep coming up? It was the Turkey team that kept coming to us and say, you have to produce a statement that is against forced, uh, you know, the, against a ban on the hijab. And they were very, very strong on this. And I, at that time, I mean, I'm, I'm not really in favor of the state telling people how to dress. So when I say that this was a good judgment of the Euro European Court on Human Rights, it's because we have a terrible situation in Europe where there is not a single body that I know of, except for bodies like ours, which are small and not very well funded and new, um, but except for people like the Council for Ex-Muslims or the Center for Secular Space, the major well-funded human rights organizations are all taking positions that are pro-Islamism and supporting the women who want to wear the veil and refusing. I know instances at Amnesty where, where researchers offered to research 
uh, instances where women were given money to wear niqab and things like that, they were told not to do it. When I gathered all the researchers together who work on issues around the veil or weren't working on them but where I ex expected it to be a problem, we discussed the human rights of veiling and whether, you know, we had a sort of sitting on the fence, you know, it's, not, it's wrong to force uh, dress on either side. Um, uh, the Saudi Arabian and the Iran team said uh, that the hu human rights framework permitted the state to enforce veiling. The Turkey team, where, the, where the, the Turkish state, as far as I know, doesn't put people in jail, it is quite harsh. It's a it's, um, uh, ban on the hijab, used to be. Um, but it had administrative measures. You know, it, it didn't uh, whip people or put them in jail. So they wanted to take a stand and thought it was a human rights issue and should be researched. The Saudi Arabia and Iran team did not. And in fact, as I said, many other groups silenced people who were trying to work on it. When you have that happening, for instance, one of the things we're told is there might be racism against people. Now, I think there is racism against women who wear visibly Muslim dress. There are anti-Muslim attacks on, on, uh, on such women. Those attacks have to be unequivocally con condemned because whether we like people or like their dress or not, obviously we don't support any form of assault on, on, on them. But there are numerous organizations that, uh, that, that do monitor these attacks and do take them on board. On the veiling, on the forced veiling issue, there's nobody. You know, I've tried to work with the police and tried to get them to take on board the issue of people being atheists, being attacked for being labeled atheists, that so this is actually a form of death threat. The police don't listen to that. Nobody, none of the human rights organizations have looked seriously at the issue of coercion. They just mention it in passing and they don't mention the considerable literature that comes from people like us that talks about the fact that women could be raped for not wearing it, they can be beaten up, they can be arrested, they can be and, whipped. And, and in a sense, and that's so the experience of a vast majority of people, it's yeah. not the other way around. Is yeah, it? and there's, there's not a single place where they can go when that happens to them. So if you're going to, and I don't think you make a choice between racism or sexism, you have to deal with both. But the fact is that where you have a ban, it protects particularly children. It protects younger people from being forced into it. And this, this, the state is then, uh, or people who want to challenge the enforced veiling can take this issue up. Uh, because you can be damn sure that the human rights organizations are not going to produce teams that monitor this kind of thing. Um, there's a hilarious, I mean, it's funny, it make you weep, but we have to laugh because we really can't weep about these things. We'd be weeping all the time. There was an amicus brief presented by a, a, human rights research body in Gret, I think from Ghent University in Belgium and they said we wanted to look at the impact of this ban on women who choose to wear the veil and they they interviewed 27 women and they said we are sure that none of them are coerced why are they sure that none of them are coerced because they said we asked them and they said Islam doesn't allow coercion therefore we're sure none of them are coerced this, this is presented as a serious piece of human rights research. You know? I mean, the thing is, you know, I guess their major argument is that it's, it's the right to dress. And I know there's a lot of contestation on the veil in the Middle East, North Africa, in many communities, and particularly the face veil. I mean, this is what the ban is really about. It's the face veil and the niqab or the burqa. Is, is it a right to dress? And what's the difference between having the right to religion and then the right to manifest it. I mean, that's not absolute, is it? There's, there's three things, actually. One is that the right to manifest is not absolute. Uh, it's, it's, it's a right that can be tempered for all sorts of reasons. And in fact, for reasons of security is one of the main, health and security, both of which come under this wearing of the niqab all the time. Um, and what you have to try and read into uh, the, the reasons for limitation is also gender discrimination. The, it's very significant that the way in which Human Rights Watch and other groups talk about the veil is that they only talk about if you're offended, you don't have the right to stop it. I'm not talking about people being offended. I'm not interested if somebody doesn't like it. That's not the point. The point is, it's a flag of political identity and that political identity is a threat to others. It puts other women at threat. It makes them... I've, I've sat, worked with women who wear the hijab and we were sitting in an uh, in South Hall, actually, in a in a community centre, and suddenly some right-wing Muslim fundamentalist group was having a meeting there. And all the women who arrived in busloads were in niqab. So it was some it was some very far-right group, and it was a woman, 
I mean, I was appalled by that meeting. And if they'd been white fascists, we'd immediately have gotten opposed them. But we kept quiet because they were Muslims. But the woman who was most threatened was a woman who was already very covered, who said, oh my God, you know, it makes me feel naked. And she felt most directly under threat. They can't force me to wear it. But they can put her in a position where she's a bad Muslim if she doesn't wear it. I mean, it's interesting when you hear the arguments for this right to dress, you know, they, talk, they use language where it says that women have a right to choose over their own bodies. Mm. And it's using that sort of women's liberation Feminist language, language. language. As, a, mm. as yeah. a way of actually restricting women, because yeah. that's what the veil is, yeah. in a sense. Exactly. And that's what's so perverse. And it's an example of how appalling the human rights bodies are on the issue of women's human rights. They do not actually believe that women are full subjects of human rights. And therefore, they refuse to investigate classic violations of human rights, where the state interferes with women's bodies to the extent that it says that women must be made invisible in public space. And because, they, you know, it's a twin thing. They, on the one hand, refuse to do that work. On the other hand, they aggressively promote Islamist women's rights in public spaces in Europe. And I think it's a form that we're seeing, we're seeing it extensively in Britain in the work that you've been doing and the campaigning with South Hall Black Sisters on universities UK and gender segregation, on the law society and their wills judgment, uh, and in the attitude that the human rights bodies take towards Islamists as their partners and friends and peoples whose ideologies that they seek to promote through their human rights work. I think this is a form of institutionalized Islamism. Yeah, explain that more because I think that's a, real, that's a new um, term, but in a sense it explains very perfectly what's going on. I think institutionalized Islamism is similar to institutionalized racism, which uh, a lot of people who worked in anti-racist movements began to look at what was happening to institutions, institutions like the police, um, like the courts, uh, various parts of the state and so on. It, the point was not whether an individual carried in his or her head racist thoughts, whether they individually hated black people uh, and they you know, wanted to do them down or beat them up. Of course, the police frequently did all those things. They invented cases, they you know, were corrupt, they um, uh, stopped and searched excessively, etc., etc. All that happens. However, the important leap was that it's not just the mind of the individual, it's the effect of a set of policies on the way in which the institution functions. That mean that, for instance, fewer people with the right qualifications will get employed if they're black. That, few, that people won't have chances. That basically they'll be discriminated against as well as coerced and beaten up and so on. And that that is a form of racism, which is a racism that's embedded in the institution. And I think that's what's happening in Britain, that Islamist ideologies are embedding themselves in major institutional forms. And regardless of whether the individual, if you ask them, do you think the Muslim Brotherhood are great? Or do you think it's OK for women to have half the witness of men or whatever? They may say, oh, no, no, we don't think that's acceptable. Or at any rate, they say, we don't think that's acceptable for us. There's, of course, a group of people that are saying, if they want it, that's fine. It's their choice and promoting what they call minority legal orders, somebody like Maliha Malik. Um, and so, so they're working with the state to actually promote vicious forms of Islamism while themselves appearing to be utterly liberal and conforming to human rights norms. So going back to the issue of the veil, I mean, do you think all forms of religious dress should be banned? Or are you, is it mainly on the issue of niqab or burqa? How does it work? You see, I, I don't think, and that's why I've really struggled with this issue of the veil, because I don't think all forms of religious dress should be banned. Whether I like them or not, uh, I think that actually, mostly, the state should not be allowed to interfere with the way people are. So it's only where everyone, everything else has failed, and I think that's really the reason that it's, it becomes a danger in itself. I think um, anybody who's coerced, like a sick man who's coerced into wearing a turban, should not be so coerced. But I don't think the wearing of a turban in itself is a signal of coercing the rest of society. You know, I don't think it's a danger to others. I think there is a, there is a threat within the community of that kind of internal coercion. Um, but I don't think they constitute a danger. Similar with the kippah or, you know, many other forms or many forms of dress. I mean, I dress very conservatively in general. And I often wear some kind of scarf around my shoulders, which is more normal in South Asia than always over the head. 
and so on. And I don't necessarily want to have to wear a suit. I may choose to wear a suit like you're wearing today, but I don't have to want to wear one out of sheer conformity. So I think people should be tolerant of a wide variety of dress. But I think the niqab really demands an exception to any form of masking. And I think that's the point that Taj Harge has made to you, you know, when he was speaking on a platform with you, that it's, it's, it is a form of mask. And it's therefore particularly, it's not only dangerous to other women, and I think all forms of hijab do carry that danger uh, because they're telling women, they make a fetish of the hair, they say you have to cover it, otherwise you are a danger to men and it's your fault if, you, if anything happens to you. Um, so I think not all forms of religious dress are sending that kind of message. The hijab in all its forms is sending that kind of message. Do you see a link between um this, the whole rise in the wearing of the Boroha, Sharia core, it's gender segregation at universities. Do you see that all as part of some sort of, um, you know, uh, well, Islamist power struggle in a sense? Uh, because I think one of the problems is that people see them all in isolation and don't necessarily see them all as related to yeah. some extent. I think or even uh, with the rise of British, the, the large number of British fighters in, uh, with ISIS now in Iraq and Syria. Yeah. Do you see links between these or not? I think they are linked because they're part of an agenda of political Islam. I think it's important to remember that, the, that many forms of fundamentalism uh, think that dress codes of women are absolutely central to their being. So all over Africa, for instance, you find the Christian evangelical groups that are attacking women for wearing trousers. They want extreme sex differentiation. So that you actually have gangs going out in the Democratic Republic of Congo, sometimes backed by certain churches, saying that we'll you know, cut off women's jeans if they're going seen wearing jeans. There was a woman in Nigeria killed for wearing trousers. So it's a serious issue. And then, of course, trousers are banned in Sudan and so on. So there was Lubla Hussein, who was very bravely um, uh, you know, uh, wore trousers to court after she was arrested for wearing trousers. The Hindu fundamentalists also try and impose dress codes. They say women have to wear saris or they have to wear bindis or they can't wear jeans in college and so on. So, you know, that it's not as harsh and as similar. And it's not as weird, the dress code, in, in the sense that it, it may be a form of dress that people wear along the way. What's interesting about the niqab and the modern forms of hijab are they are an anti-culture, which is not what people traditionally wore. And therefore, it's the most extreme dress code. And in fact, when we've said to um, Islamist women, oh, you're, you know, you're not wearing traditional dress, so we don't wear traditional dress, we're modern women. We wear modern Islamic dress. They're very proud of the fact that it's actually anti-cultural and that it's not what their grandmother, their grandmas were in anything from, you know, mini skirts to um, saris or, you know, depending where they came from. They wore a huge range of different kinds of clothes. Um, but these women are saying, no, we want to be completely covered and it's, that shows that we're wearing Islamic dress. So it's, it's worst among Muslim fundamentalists, but Orthodox Jews, there's been an increasing attempt to force women to cover their arms. Little girls, you know, have been attacked for not having their arms covered and to segregate buses. So the issue of gender segregation and extreme dress codes that in a way put a circle around women go together and they go together with attacks on women in public spaces. So again, you have the example of Hindu fundamentalists who burst into bars where drinking is legal in India. It's not even that it was being done under the counter. You know, it's a Bangalore, city full of bars, city full of working women who go out on their own and drink if they choose to. And they attacked women in a bar. And then the women formed a, uh, a group of loose drinking, <laughs> loose women who drink and something. There was some, 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 something that's like a that on Facebook page. Oh, yeah, that's yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they also sent pink underpants to all these men who were imposing <laughs> dress codes. <laughs> <laughs> so they, hundreds of women, thousands of women sent pink underpants to this group to Sometimes shame that's the them. Best type of challenge, I think that's the best yeah. type of thing to do. Is that they, they really should be um, challenged. You know, even making these, um, what I now see as ridiculous human rights statements that just say we don't want you know, coercion this way, we don't want coercion that way. It's failing to look at the forms of coercion. It's a cop out because it's not, they're not equal. They're absolutely not equal. The coercion of forcing somebody to wear a veil, whether it's done in the community or done in, in, um, by the state in Iran or Saudi Arabia, is, 
is one set of things. And the women who say we choose to and our rights and freedoms are being restricted are wearing an ugly flag of political identity. And they're demanding an exception. They're using religion to say it's an exception to the normal practices which would stop, at, you know, where, where they would not be allowed to walk around with face masks. So, I mean, you know, I would prefer the mask to be banned, but if the niqab is banned specifically as a niqab, I think that's also allowable because it is a form of danger. It's a signal that other women are, are fair game to be raped. That's what the signal is. The woman wearing it is saying, I'm pure, but you can be raped. And that's not about offence. That is, that is a signal of, it's a form of hate speech. Thank you, Gita. Thank you. به نظرم گیتا ساکت خیلی حرفای جالبی زد یه, یکی، یه حرف خوبی هم که زد این بود که خب لزوما شاید با همه دلایلی که دولت فرانسه آورده شاید آدم موافق نباشه خود من مثلا این بحث این که از نظر امنیت نباید کسی برغا بپوشه یا این که اجازه نمیده زن مثلا بتونه خوب با آدم های دیگه حرف بزنه اینا به نظرم مسئله دوم من مسئله اصلی و اول اینه که بالاخره زن حقوقش داره نقض میشه و باید از 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 زاوی حقوق دفاع دفاع حقوق زن از برقا به برقا مخالفت کرد اما به هر حال خوب نظر خودتونم به ما بگین ما مشتاق شنیدن از شما هستیم الان ولی دیگه رسیدیم به اون بخش فتواهای احمقانه این هفته و مال این هفته هست دو 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 دو. در یک مصاحبه با شبکه محیط دکتر دکترم هست یوسف اید که منشی کمیته فتوا الازهاره چه کمیتهایی دارن اینا گفته بود که زکات در موقع رمضان اجباریه و گفت بعد یه دلار باشه و گفت اگر نکنی خب حرومی چیزی کار بدی کردی کار حرومی کردی ولی اگر مثلا مخالفت کنی با دادن این زکات بعد دیگه باید باید بجنگن و هر کی تو دولت اونجا باید تو رو بکشه چون این یه پایه اسلامه و خیلی جالبه یعنی همیشه وقتی میاد به اسلام تهش یه کشتاری باید همیشه باشه تا اینا راضی باشن خیلی جالبه اولا این آقا دکتر دکتر شد دکتر شد تو فتوا گرفت یعنی <تصفيق> و اسم اینو باید بزنید فتوای دیوانه 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 یه مافیایی که به اشکال مختلف از مردم پول میگیرن و در واقع همینه در واقع و حواسشون هم هست به دلار حساب میکنن که توی بازار ارز قیمتش این برابر میشه آره یفق ارزشش پایین نه نه باشه آره یک دو یه ثابت میخوام ولی فکر کنم که اهمیت این قضیه همینه که اینا یه مرکز درآمد برای این جریان اسلامی و هر کس هم میگه باش مخالفت کنه الهاز اصولی باش مخالفت کنه یعنی بخوای زیرا به منبع در آمده اینا رو در حالی سرتون میبورن مثلا همین ده. الان کاری که مثلا داعش داره میکنه توی اراق میگه که تشویق مثلا به اصطلاح به اسلام اینه که میگه یا مذهب تو بذار کنار بیا این وریا میکشم یعنی دو تا انتخاب میده این هم همینه یعنی طوری که اینا میخوان افزایش بدن تعداد خودشون رو با تهدید به مرگ و فتوا و از این چیز هست حتی اونجایی که به اصطلاح به چیزای خیریه میخواد برسه خیریه های اسلامی بالاخره چیز دیگه اینم اینم واقعا اینا ما بهش میخندیم ولی متاسفانه این آدما خیلی هاشون توی حکومت هم تو خیلی کشورها و واقعا دارن زندگی مردم رو سیاه میکنن امیدوارم از این برنامه خوشتون اومده باشه حتما با همون تماس بگیرین هی hey, ادامه بدین دیدن برنامه ما رو برای ما خیلی جای خوشحالیه که براتون برنامه درست کنیم پس و امیدوارم که برای شما هم جای خوشحالی باشه که بشینیم پای برنامه ما هفته خوبی داشته باشین تا هفته آینده بای